All right, it's 7 o'clock. If everybody please take a seat. And let me say how wonderful it is to see all of you men here. Our second week in a row, we continue to go strong, which is exactly what I expected. Ooh. And tonight we are going to study the Word of God for one hour, concluding right at 8 o'clock. And we continue with Joshua, which we started last week. We looked at the background of Joshua, especially the life of Moses. And that gave us a context to understand who Joshua was and what he was called to do. So let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, able to cut through bone and marrow. In other words, it is able to change our lives. And I pray that as we read the word, it will read us back and change us more into your likeness, Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're asking the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Jesus to be our teacher tonight, to guide us. And the name Joshua comes from the same name that Jesus finds his name through, which is the Hebrew word Yeshua. Translated in the Greek Old Testament, we get Jesus. So Joshua is an archetype of Christ. And last week we looked at that. I'll simply review what we talked about in terms of how Joshua points to Christ as the true fulfillment of our saving help. Three prominent types in Joshua are one, Joshua, leader of the host of Israel, a type of Christ, the captain of our salvation. Two, the crossing of the Jordan is a type of the Christians dying with Christ. And three, Israel's conquest of Canaan typifies the Christians' victories over the enemies of the soul. So as we look at the life of Joshua, we'll understand him as we also see it fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And we'll look at the New Testament throughout this study, seeing how this is fulfilled in Jesus. Now, if you're new to studying the Bible, I don't want you to feel intimidated at all. The Bible is not a novel. It's not something we can read and be done with. It's something that each time we read it, if you're like me, with the Holy Spirit's help, you see something different each time. That's why the Bible is described as living and breathing and active, because it's a living book. And we shouldn't just know the book, we should know the author. And that really makes all the difference as we study the scriptures. So if you're feeling like, I don't really know the Bible, how can I keep up? Just relax, and we'll help each other as we study the Word of God. We're going to begin Joshua chapter 1, verse 10, which is where we started as we concluded last week. We're going to actually go back again, just as we did last week, into a previous book of the Bible. And we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, which John's going to read for us. Deuteronomy chapter 7. I can't give you a page number because everybody has different Bibles, but do your best to find it. It's the book right before Joshua. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And after that's read, I'll make a few comments about what we just read, and then we'll jump back into Joshua. John? Very good. Uh, chapter 7, driving out the nations. When the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess, and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, Seven nations larger and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you, and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them. Show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters and to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are the people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples of the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples. 
But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. But those who hate him, he will repay their face by destruction. He will not be slow to repay them, their face, those who hate him. Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees and laws that I give you today. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb and the crops of your land, your grain, your new wine and oil, and the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks in the land that he swore to your forefathers to give to you. You will be blessed more than any other people. None of your men or women will be childless, nor any of your livestock without young. The Lord will keep you free from every disease. He will not inflict on you the horrible diseases you knew in Egypt, but he will inflict them on all who hate you. He must destroy all the peoples, you must destroy all the peoples the Lord your God gives over to you. Do not look on them with pity. Do not serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. You may say to yourselves, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. You saw with your own eyes the great trials and miraculous signs and wonders, the mighty hand and outstretched arm with which the Lord your God brought you out. The Lord your God will do the same to all peoples you now fear. Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them until even the survivors who hide from you have perished. Do not be terrified by them, for the Lord your God, who is among you, is a great and awesome God. The Lord your God will drive out those nations before you, little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once, or the wild animals will multiply around you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you, throwing them into the great confusion until they are destroyed. He will give their kings into your hand, and you will wipe out their names from under heaven. No one will be able to stand up against you. You will destroy them. The images of their gods you are to burn in the fire. Do not covet the silver and gold on them. And do not take it for yourselves, or you will be ensnared by it. For it is detestable to the Lord your God. Do not bring a detestable thing into your house, or you, like it, will be set apart for destruction. Utterly abhor and detest it, for it is set apart for destruction. Thank you. It's the Old Testament wrath. Oh boy. Yes, this is a call to holy war. And this is predicted long before Joshua would even go into the promised land. And did you notice verse 22? The Lord your God will drive out these nations before you little by little. So it's not Joshua driving them out. It's the power of God. But it's not going to be an overnight occurrence. We'll see that it takes seven years for this to be accomplished. Now some of you may be thinking, this sounds like the Old Testament God of wrath that I've heard about seems very different from the New Testament God. Well, let me ask you to consider this. This is a directive for so-called holy war, a conflict led by the Lord against hostile and irredeemable foes who have an implacable resistance to God and his people. God in his sovereign grace makes decisions based upon his omniscient wisdom in line with plans and purposes known and knowable only to him. What seems arbitrary and even unfair to us must be understood as the best possible action for God to take. This was true of his election, his choice of Israel, but one people out of the myriads from which he could have chosen. 
to impose human standards of fairness on a righteous and all-wise God is the height of arrogance. He is answerable to no man. In a covenant context such as this, love does not refer to the emotional or providential aspect of God's character. In those senses, he loves all people equally. Here the term is synonymous with choice. The Lord is saying that he chose Israel simply because he chose her. His love is his loyalty to the covenant he has granted. This sheds light on the difficult statement, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau, from Malachi 12, 3. Excuse me, 1, 2 to 3. Love and hate do not signify emotions of attraction or revulsion, but are expressions of the presence or absence of a special bond of loyalty. In fulfillment of God's directive for holy war, the Israelites must destroy the Canaanite peoples. The reasons for such severe action is made clear when the command to destroy the wicked is followed immediately by the prohibition from worshiping their gods. To allow the Canaanites to survive would be to leave Israel vulnerable to idolatry. Reactions? Dan. I have a question. A uh, while back, um, obviously this is from the liberal press, um, um, I guess PBS, and they kind of tacked the Bible quite a bit. But um, recently they did a DNA test of the Lebanese and the Israelis, and they found out that their genetics were not that different from each other. And I also remember in some of the courses that um, they said that sometimes they, they did practice pagan religions. They um, had like a, a um, god and goddess that they sometimes worshiped in Israel. So I guess they didn't fully obey that command, I guess, but it infiltrated over time into their society? Or well, that was part of the problem. The surrounding nations conducted everything from simple idolatry to child sacrifice to the god Moloch, where they would take an infant and put it on a red-hot hand of an idol. I won't get any more graphic than that. It was a deplorable action. And Israel was constantly being threatened by the possibility that they would become just like the other nations. And what God was doing, for reasons that only God can understand, is setting them apart. Why? Because he simply chose to. Israel had nothing that offered merit or anything special. They were simply chosen, starting with Abraham, chosen out of Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia. this man who was a wanderer, who was most likely a, a moon worshiper, was called to faith. And his faith was his righteousness. And three things were promised to Abraham, a place, the presence of God, and possessions, including children. Those were promised to Abraham. More than the grains of the sand or the stars of the sky, so shall your descendants be. And do you remember what the problem was with Abraham and Sarah? She was barren. They were barren and they were very old. And so God began to work a miracle starting with them, which brings us to this moment where the Israelites, even though they're stiff-necked people, God has a stiffer neck and God is leading them through the wilderness and promising them this place. But it's conditional. And it's going to take time. And it's going to require a strong leader, and that's Joshua, Yeshua, the archetype of Christ. So let's jump right into Joshua now. We start with verse 10 of chapter 1. <clears throat> you mentioned earlier um, the, the word, the author. How have we, um, who is reputed to you be the author of these days of the book of Joshua? Well, there are different scholarly perspectives. Uh, most, I think, would say Joshua, except that some has been added. You know, when you describe the death of somebody in their book, it yeah. can't be them. Um, yeah. But it's believed to be Joshua. Yeah. Certainly through oral tradition, which was later written yeah. down. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get provisions ready for yourselves. For within three days you will be crossing the Jordan to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you to inherit. So last week, what did God say to Joshua? What would he need to be in order for this to be accomplished? Strong and courageous. Strong and courageous. So how many times was that uttered? Three times. Three times, which has significance in the Bible. As I said last week, Whenever something's mentioned three times, that's like God's way of underlining it and putting exclamation points. So notice it, be strong and courageous. And I would ask you gentlemen, 
Were you strong and courageous this week by God's grace in one area or another? You can think about that. Okay. Because we're meant to mutually encourage each other in our walk of faith in this day and age. Just as God is encouraging Joshua and the people, God is encouraging us in Christ. Okay, so I'm actually going to appeal now to our study guide. Some of you may not have it yet. You can share with someone near you. There are a few things we'll look at. One will be a map in a moment. <clears throat> but right now, we're on page 16. Now, after reading verses 10 and 11, would you consider the key phrase or word here? Again, I'll read it again. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get provisions ready for yourselves, for within three days you will be crossing the Jordan to go in and take possession of the land your God is giving you to inherit. What are some key words or phrases in that? Ready. 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 Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Commanded. Commanded. Prepare. Prepare. Take possession. Yeah. That's it. Give me, give me. Mm -hmm. That the Lord your God is giving you to inherit. The New Testament talks about an inheritance that through Christ we've received everything. The kingdom. And so this points to that, even in this context of what we call the Old Testament. God is giving an inheritance. Now when we think about inheritances, we often think about money and what we might be left in a will and you know, you can envision those television shows where everybody's waiting in the lawyer's office to see what they get. It rarely happens that way, I understand, by the way. Uh, but the idea of an inheritance spiritually is what we're all about. The problem is we often don't realize how much of an inheritance we have. Imagine if you had been left millions and millions of dollars, but you didn't know it or you didn't think you could access it. You'd live very differently if you realized actually you could access it and have all of it now. Well, that's what the kingdom of God is like, as Jesus promised it. We've got the full inheritance now, the full arsenal of God for the spiritual battle we're waging, the full love of God unconditionally given to us. There's nothing we can do to get God to love us any more or any less than God already does in Jesus. So this inheritance is a big theme in this part of the scriptures. So they're about to claim it, but it's going to take a journey. Okay. Joshua said to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh. I'm just going to stop there for a moment. If you're able to turn to this map, <clears throat> if you have it, if not, just hold it up for those that can see it. What we have here is the Mediterranean Sea and then modern-day Israel. But it's the ancient context. These are the Canaanites who are controlling the area that's going to be taken over. East of the Jordan, you've got two and a half tribes. Now, how many tribes in Israel were there? Twelve. Twelve. Well, here are two and a half residing on the eastern side. And we'll understand why that is the case in a moment. Joshua said to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Remember what Moses the Lord's servant commanded you when he said, The Lord your God will give you rest, and he will give you this land. Now, remember last week we talked about rest as part of the promise of what this entire conquest is meant to achieve. Rest. Now, why two and a half tribes? Why are two and a half tribes being spoken to? Well, we have to understand the context. Now, perhaps some of you all thought you might join this Bible study and we'd do a survey course and be finished with Joshua in like six weeks, but that's not going to happen. You know, the ancient rabbis would spend months on a single verse or a word back and forth, back and forth. And so I'd like us to have a lot of back and forth dialogue as much as you're comfortable with that. And we're going to take as much time as we need to move through the scriptures according to the Holy Spirit's guidance. So we're going to go back to the book of Numbers, which Harlan has agreed to read for us, to understand what the context is with these two and a half tribes, their land, and what they're being asked to do. So Harlan, if you could please read 
Numbers 32, 1 through 42. Numbers 32, 1 through 42. And let's take a moment as we find our place. Which is the whole chapter. It's the whole chapter. It's dense. Uh, if you'd like to follow along using this Bible, it begins on page 145. Peter. What's the reference again, please? Pardon me? What's the reference again? Numbers, numbers chapter 32. Got it. Thank numbers 32, 1 through 42. And we're going to understand what the basis of Joshua's appeal to them is really all about. Now, the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, and behold, a place was a place for cattle. So the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben came and said to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the congregation, Arioth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Eliela, Sebam, Nebo, and Beon. The land which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and your servants have cattle. And they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants for a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. Did you repeat that? Do not take us across the Jordan. Do not take us across the Jordan. Okay, so they're fat and happy. They've got their place, right? They're on the eastern side of the Jordan. They're establishing their lives. Cows like it. Yep. <laughs> but Moses said to the sons of Gad and to the sons of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to the war while you sit here? Why will you discourage the heart of the people of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord has given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the people of Israel from going into the land which the Lord had given them. And the, day, and the Lord's anger was kindled on that day, and he swore, saying, Surely none of the men who came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. None except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and the, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun. For they have wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years, until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. And behold, you have risen in your father's stead, a brood of sinful men, to increase still more the fierce anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will again abandon them in the wilderness, and you will destroy all this people. Then they came near to him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our flocks and cities for our little ones. But we will take up arms ready to go before the people of Israel until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones shall live in the fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until the people of Israel have inherited each his inheritance. For we will not inherit with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond, because our inheritance has come to us on this side of the Jordan to the east. So Moses said to them, If you will do this, if you will take up arms to go before the Lord for the war, and every armed man of you will pass over the Jordan before the Lord until he has driven out his enemies from before him, and the land is subdued before the Lord, then after that, you shall return and be free of obligation to the Lord and to Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Build cities for your little ones and folds for your sheep, and do what you have promised. And the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben said to Moses, Your servants will do as the Lord commands. Our little ones, our wives, our flocks, and all our cattle shall remain there in the cities of Gilead. But your servants will pass over every man who is armed for war before the Lord to battle, as my Lord commands. 
So Moses gave command concerning them to Eleazar the priest, and to Joshua the son of Nun, and to the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel. And Moses said to them, If the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben, every man who is armed to battle before the Lord, will pass with you over the Jordan, and the land shall be subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilead for a possession. But if they will not pass over with you armed, they shall have possession among you in the land of Canaan. And the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben answered, As the Lord has said to your servants, so we will do. We will pass over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan, and the possession of our inheritance shall remain with us beyond the Jordan. And, the Mo and Moses gave to them to the sons of Gad and to the sons of Reuben and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, the land and its cities with their territories, the cities of the land throughout the country. And the sons of Gad built Debon, Ataroth, Aroer, Atroth-Shophan, Jazer, Jogbahath, Baha, Beth Nimrah, Beth Haran, fortified cities and folds for sheep. And the sons of Reuben built Heshbon, Eliala, Kiriathaim, Nebo, Baal Maon, their names to be changed, and Sidma. I'm glad their names were changed. Boy, a whole lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave other names to the cities which they built. And then the sons of Machir, the son of Manasseh, went to Gilead and took it, and dispossessed the Amorites who were in it. And Moses gave Gilead to Machir, the son of Manasseh, and he settled in it. And Jair, the son of Manasseh, went and took their villages and called them Havoth Jair. And Nobah went and took Kenath and its villages and called it Noba after his own name. Thank you, Harlan. Aren't you all glad I asked Harlan to read? <laughs> you get your ten dollars back. <laughs> and then some. One thing I want to mention is Psalm 136. You can look at that another time. Mentions the love of the Lord enduring forever. It's a constant refrain. It's a reminder that they would remember the Israelites, all that God had done for them. And there are two verses in that. 136 psalm that mention Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. And if you wonder where that comes from, you just read about it. That's one of the victories God gave Israel over their enemies by dispossessing others and giving them their land even before they cro would cross the Jordan. Now, if we could have our map man hold up page 7 for our <laughs> viewing audience, I can give you my book if you like. Give me your book. Go ahead and use that. You can see that, if you turn to page 7, you can see the two and a half tribes and what they owned by way of land that had been given to them conditionally before the conquest across the Jordan. Thank you. Now, would, the, would the land east of the Jordan have been considered part of the promised land initially, or is that sort of a, they we like it here? And just it, um, it was not formally the promised land. It was given to them along the way with the understanding that, as we just heard, they could keep it as long as they were part of the conquest into the promised land. In other words, as long as all 12 tribes would get promised land, they could keep theirs. And the reason we looked at this is to get a better sense of what Joshua was calling them to be true to. As we look back to verse 10, then Joshua commanded the officers of the people Go through the camp and tell the people, get provisions ready for yourselves. For within three days you will be crossing the Jordan to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God has given you to inherit. Joshua said to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Remember what Moses the Lord's servant commanded you when he said, The Lord your God will give you rest and he will give you this land. So Joshua is calling to remembrance what they had agreed to with Moses. Now what could they have done? if they had been disobedient. They could have said, we're going to sit right where we are. We're very comfortable. Thank you very much. Moses is dead. Good luck. 
You're on your own. You're on your own. When they conquered these other territories, what happened to the people who were there? Were they just driven out or they were conquered people? They were completely conquered. Except there was one problem in one case, only part of them were conquered and the Israelites were punished for that. When God commanded them to completely obliterate a nation, God meant what he said. And the reason is that idolatry would creep back in if they didn't fulfill God's commands. And we'll see more of that throughout the accounts. And granted, contextually, it may be very difficult for us to even receive this, to think what kind of God would initiate such a campaign. And if you're feeling that way, that's perfectly natural. But as I read at the beginning, we have to, in a sense, read it in its context and step away and see the larger purposes of God, even in ways that we can't fully understand. And the fact is, without Joshua, without the Promised Land, you have no Jesus of Nazareth, just to make it plain. It's a rough road to get there, but when you think about our lives, we've had rough roads to get where we are, by God's grace. God works with what he has. And why did God choose you? Because he chose you, just like Israel. It wasn't like there was a contest between the greatest nations and Israel won. In many ways, Israel was the most unimpressive nation. But then again, so was Jesus. Remember Isaiah 53. He had no majesty that we might be drawn to him. Yes. Was the, the, the people that were in the lands, were, were they given an option, by the way, to sort of follow the Lord, or they were simply just slain? They were slain. But I think what we can read into it is the fact that they were looking to destroy God's people. Understandably, right. they were invading their territory, and it was a brutal, brutal situation. Right. Really, I think if I'm sure. I, I think if we if we look at those people as as and remember what they were doing as far as the, the child sacrifices and all of that, and and think of those people as sin. Okay, and and God does not negotiate with sin. So when and and at times we do. Um, and that's when we're when we're not listening to God. So when he said go in and destroy these people, these, these sinful people, the, the sin, okay, there's there's also reference somewhere that Egypt itself is considered sin and, and when you know God brought Israel out of Egypt, he was bringing them through the waters, through baptism, out of sin. So all of this is sin. So you don't negotiate with sin. You kill sin. Um, otherwise, then it creeps back in to our lives. So I've heard that these were considered, these peoples were considered sin. It could be similar to what happened there in the story of Noah. Obviously, the people were debauchery and evil and, and Christ. you got to get water, cleanse the earth. Yeah, get rid of it. And child sacrifice was one of their main mainstays within their worship, if you will. And when you think about the incarnation, where Mary bore the child Jesus and how precious that was, and how they fled to Egypt because Herod was slaughtering the innocents. I mean, there's a lot of evil and murder surrounding children throughout the history of the scriptures. And this is one example where that was rampant. And Israel was called to be set apart. And so there could be no allowance for any kind of creeping of idolatrous ways back into the camp of Israel. We've seen how that happened as you read through Deuteronomy. And so God is purifying a people, and he's chosen Joshua to do that. And now Joshua is calling upon the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh to step up and agree to what they'd agreed to. So we're at verse 13. Remember what Moses, the Lord's servant, commanded you when he said, The Lord your God will give you rest and he will give you this land. So rest and land are, in a sense, one and the same. Remember, they've been wandering. They've had no home. Even Jesus embodied this, didn't he, when he said, foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was wandering, embodying Israel in the wilderness. So Joshua goes on to say, your wives, young children, and livestock may remain in the land Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. So they're not going to be called to cross the Jordan into a warfare zone. But your fighting men must cross over in battle formation ahead of your brothers and help them until the Lord gives our brothers rest as he has given you 
and they too possess the land the Lord your God is giving them. So two and a half of the twelve tribes have rest. They have land. They're settled. But the others are without lands. And so it's a community call that no one is going to rest until everybody rests. And Ray, I'd ask you to read a scripture. If you please read that now. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Could you read that one more time for us? If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. All right, that's a New Testament call to the church to bear one another's burdens. The body of Christ is one. And the sense is that if one suffers, we all suffer. If someone needs help, we all step up. And that's really how our church works today, I have to say. And I'm pleased to say. I see St. Paul's doing that. And so this was an ancient version of what we try to do today by God's grace, which is to say that unless everybody's experiencing the kingdom, something's wrong. It shouldn't be that two and a half out of 12 are experiencing kingdom blessedness. We all should be. And if we see others who are in need or not experiencing it, we're called to step up and go to spiritual war to make sure that they get that. Does that make sense? just to apply to a current context of how the church should work. Can you think of some examples where, you know, we as a church have tried to give one another land, if you will, a place of rest? Well, Joe, just a quick thing I just noticed when I read back through it. It wasn't that they were just called to go with them, but at least in my translation it says you must lead the other tribes. So it's like you, you have your place, you're set, you now need to lead the way for everybody else to get there. So. Right people who are sort of, you know, God's given you what you have, it's, you know, calling us to then lead those who don't to get what, what God's going to give them. But I don't know, does that stick through kind of the seven years that they fight, that these tribes are always kind of leading the way, or is that just kind well, of... We're going to see. And great question, a great point you brought out, and I think we can apply that to what we're talking about which is if you've been given strength in whatever form you might describe that. In the biblical sense, strength could be wealth, knowledge, spiritual power. We're called to share that with the body, to lead the way, just as they did. Now, disobedience would be to say, well, I'm fat and happy. I've got everything I want, thank you. You know, like, I'm a fat sheep. I don't need to, to help anybody. But this is what's happening. God is saying, remember what you agreed to. Now let's go. It's all about rest. If some of you have been spiritually wandering and have found a place at St. Paul's, if you're experiencing the kingdom of God, you're catching a glimpse, or maybe even the full experience now, of what rest in Christ can be like. That's why Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and in need of rest, and I will refresh you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He's done all the warfare for us. All of this we're reading points to Jesus. Okay, verse 15. Until the Lord gives our brothers rest as he has given you, and they too possess the land the Lord your God has given them. You may then return to the land of your inheritance and take possession of what Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on the east side of the Jordan. They answered Joshua, everything you have commanded us, we will do. And everywhere you send us, we will go. We will obey you, just as we obeyed Moses in everything. And may the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your order and does not obey your words and all that you have commanded him will be put to death. Above all, be strong and courageous. There it is again. Be strong and courageous. And last week we talked about Paul's words to Timothy when he said to young Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-control. And oftentimes we can feel timid, like, oh, we can't do this. Or I don't have enough strength. Or how can I know this? And the message of the gospel is you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. That's how you can be strong and courageous.
Now our study guide says, analyze the various ingredients of the reply of the two and one half tribes. So we're looking at verses 16 and 18, which I just read to you. I'll read it again. And as I read it, analyze the various ingredients of the reply of the two and one half tribes. They answer Joshua, everything you have commanded us we will do, and everywhere you send us we will go. We will obey you just as we obeyed Moses in everything. And may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your order and does not obey your words and all that you command him will be put to death. Above all, be strong and courageous. So what are some ingredients of the reply of the two and one half tribes? Well, obedience, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, whatever you command them to do, and whatever it sends them to do. Obedience. And enforcement. Enforcement. And really a blessing following the obedience. Yeah. And the Lord your God be with you as he was with God. There's almost a blind faithfulness there. I mean, obviously, the death just took place. Joshua is telling them to go. And they go. So they're certainly filled with the spirit to follow Joshua. Anyone else? It must have been scary in a way that they were there 40 years from the desert. They were the children, and all they knew was the desert and how they're going in there, going in without, I guess, really that foundation, and I guess. Joshua and God are reinforcing that he is with them and that if they follow the laws that they would come and protect them. But I've been thinking about that, how scary that must be. You, all you know is the desert, right? Mm -hmm. And even after they eventually do conquer the place, it took them a long time to build that unity there. So these people were literally children of the desert. That's all they knew. And here they are going in there with these massive armies all the different groups, the Egyptians, the Amorites, the, and the other groups that are there. It must have been very terrifying. It's a great perspective. I think about some people who are so accustomed to be, being spiritually bound or limited that the idea of growing and expanding can be frightening. Even with all the promises before us, sometimes we can be cowardly and be comfortable with what we've become. Uh, that can be the case with human pain. Sometimes our pain becomes our identity. But God is forever calling us to liberation and freedom. And it's possible that as these desert wanderers only knew the desert, as much as the promise was always before them, sure, it would be a huge change. And it wouldn't be without its challenges. Keep in mind that the Jordan River was at its high point this time of year. Dangerous. Two million people would be asked to cross it. This is no small feat. And so if you've got the two and a half tribe mentality, if you were disobeying, you'd say, well, Life's pretty good. I think I'll just stop right here. Quit while I'm ahead. That's not the call of God. And that's not how God calls us in this day and age. God calls us to risk, to step out in faith, to go into the unknown, to step out on the water, as Jesus called Peter to do, and not look down, but to have faith. When we look down, we fall, we fall in the water too. All right, well, those were good responses to the question of what the various ingredients of the reply would be. Now, question number four in our study guide asks, what spiritual truths have you learned from these verses? So if we take the whole of chapter one, especially what we read tonight, 10 through 18, but you're welcome to go back to, to verse one. In our last 15 minutes, let's talk about chapter one. What, what spiritual truths came out of this for you? Again, uh, keep in mind that a lot of this is contextually foreign to us, but I believe we've been able to tease out some very important spiritual <coughs> lessons that are relevant to our lives today, especially as we look at Joshua as a forerunner of Christ, embodying what Jesus has ultimately done for the world. Well, I guess be strong and courageous would have to be in there because it's so often repeated. Mm -hmm. It's repeated a lot, isn't it? Yeah. So... Be strong and courageous. Page 15 talks about, the, the number five talks about what important spiritual lessons taught by this segment. And I was just thinking, like, um, 
like what you're saying, be, be strong, courageous, trust in God, study the Bible, and to live a moral life. I mean, because I guess it's hard for us, like you said, wrap our heads around this idea because we're not going into a new country, like we're not, we're not inventing a country, so to speak. And um, how do we apply that today, especially like you were saying before, how it's hard to, you know, to fully conceive the idea because like a lot of these notions from the scriptures comes off as genocide. I, I hear people that are atheists argue with me all the time about these very passages. I cringe at the, you know, at the same time reading them because some of them are horrible. I hear, you know, slaughter them all, don't ask any questions. And like you guys were saying before about how God, you know, God has a different plan than us. It's hard, I mean, his plan is, you know, it's not like, how can I feel like, at least with Jesus, he sounds very loving and kind, but he was militant too, if you really read some of his stuff, when he called that, that group woman a, a dog. You know, he, he wasn't, or like yesterday's lesson about um, John, about um, Greeks wanted to meet him, and he didn't want to take the time. So, I mean, I guess in this part of the world, diversity was not a good thing. Good perspective, Danny. Absolutely. We, we need to read it in context, but we also need to remember that Jesus was a warrior. He wasn't just a soft, woolly Sunday school character. He was a warrior. He was in the spirit of Joshua. He had the seven full gifts of the Holy Spirit as Isaiah reveals them. Wisdom, fear of the Lord, counsel, might. I mean, he was strong, and he laid his life down as a choice. The ultimate warrior who lays down his life for his friends on the cross. That is our Joshua. And we see that in the person of Joshua from the Old Testament, it's all about a singular purpose and a mission. And nothing could stop it. Nothing could thwart it. There was no room for sin, as Ray brought up. And we, we need to read it in that context and not apply or modernize entirely to it, but to understand that it's a much more textured description of what life was like back then and what God's ultimate plan would be. And it's okay to say, I don't understand this. Or I wouldn't have done it that way. Of course you wouldn't because you're human, right? Uh, but as, as people read this, <clears throat> it's easy to say, oh boy, that's a very upsetting verse. And indeed it can be. But the thing about the Hebrew scriptures compared to the other writings from a lot of the other polytheistic nations around Israel is this. The Hebrew writings are very honest. They admit their defeats. They admit their struggles. If you read Genesis, it's X-rated in some places, right? If you look at a lot of the scriptures from the other nations, what you'll primarily see is all their victories. No admission of defeat. And there's a very interesting comparison when you line them up side by side. And we could spend more time talking about uh, the veracity and the authenticity of the New Testament, which we often address in the Alpha Course in those places where we talk about that. But uh, what we're focusing on now is Joshua. But this is reliable. If you look at the sources and look at the journey, it's reliable. In a, it's the in Word a, of God. In a sense, we almost, I don't want to say we have it easier, but we have this. And we, have, and we know the end of the story. These guys were just going straight on faith. Um, we, we can read that they actually did conquer. We, we, we know, and I just, you know, you go back, at, so it's all about faith and trusting the one who's leading, uh, which is not Joshua, which is God. Um, one of my favorite verses about faith is Hebrews 11. <coughs> Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So these guys were certain of what they could not see. Um, they haven't even crossed the, 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 the river yet. They haven't even seen these guys, the, the armies yet. And, and they're certain of God and being able to take that. And that's the way we should just have faith and hope for certain, you know, and be certain of Jesus. He said it, I'm done. <laughs> it ultimately comes down to faith, and it began with faith with Abraham. His faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, he couldn't offer God anything, only faith. And God said, through that faith, you'll be righteous. And that takes us all the way to Jesus, where we're justified by faith, not works of the law. <clears throat> Well, if somebody would be willing to read 
from the study guide on page 16 into 17. This is a wonderful conclusion to chapter 1. Anybody out there willing to read that? <coughs> Patrick, thanks. Uh, section 2. <clears throat> yes, where it begins after Moses' death. After Moses' death, God <clears throat> commanded Joshua to take his place at the head of the nation and lead the people over Jordan into the Promised Land. It is enlightening to learn what God chose to include in his eight verse charge to Joshua, considering the multitude of things he might have said. Humanly speaking, God set before Joshua an impossible task. How could two million people be led across such a river, high and turbulent at that time of the year, when enemy nations on the other side of the Jordan were expected to prevent such an invasion? Look at the map on page 18 and read the names of the great nations that then inhabited Canaan. These I'll, nations those. I'll just read those briefly for you. Girgashites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, Amorites, Hittites, Philistines, Amalekites, Edomites, Sidonians, etc. These nations were well versed in war, firmly entrenched in strong walled cities, and prepared to fight for every foot of their territory. The map shows only the locations where the enemy nations were probably concentrated. Segments of the population were found in other locations as well. But in giving such a command, God also spoke words to Joshua intended to dispel all his fears. First, God gave a view of the inheritance. Surely those valuable possessions were worth having, but could the enemies that held them be overcome? As if to remove any such fear from Joshua's mind, God gave him next the assurance of success. He revealed to Joshua what would be the secret of his success, a secret that will ensure the success of any child of God anywhere and any time. Constant meditation on the scriptures and obedience to their commands. With all this, Joshua was given the promise of God's continual presence. Thus encouraged, Joshua was not afraid to undertake to lead the people into Canaan, difficult as the task appeared from a merely human standpoint. When God had finished speaking, Joshua sent an order throughout the camp that must have sent a thrill of rapture through every heart. The promise that their forefathers had forfeited was soon to be fulfilled for them. If this had been the old, unsurrendered crowd of the wilderness, which rebelled against every command given them, they would no doubt have objected to this order to cross the Jordan. They would have begun to murmur and complain, saying, Why such haste? We've been many years on the way to get this far. Why not wait until the river lowers? But this was not the old wilderness crowd. Under the influence of Moses' farewell address, the nation had evidently seen the futility of trusting in their own strength, wisdom, and judgment, and had resolved to put themselves unreservedly under God's direction. They surrendered absolutely and unconditionally to God, and in the power of their faith they sent back this answer to their leader, All that thou commandest us, we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. This was the company that God led on to victory, enabling them to take Canaan in seven years. We too will experience victorious living if we present ourselves wholeheartedly to our great Joshua, Jesus, with the same words. Whatsoever thou commandest us, we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest, sendest us, we will go. Thank you, Patrick. Well done with the King James English. <coughs> Do you have any reflections or comments on what Patrick just read? You can kind of begin to see God's purposes in, in allowing that rebellious generation to die off. You know, and the, the, it wasn't purposeless. It was so that the new generation could learn vicariously from all those lessons. That listen, you know, trusting what we want to do is not going to work. So we better go. Tr where else are we going to go? We have to go trust God. And so that might have been purposeful. Great point. I think about my own children. Sometimes I'll say to my younger son, you know, it's not always bad being the younger son because you get to learn from the older one's mistakes. And it's true, the younger generation of Israelites saw and heard everything that happened. I mean, some terrible things happened. You remember the um, rebellion of Korah, it was called, where they tried to topple Moses' leadership and the ground opened up and they were gone. Uh, there are other <coughs> stories where things happen to people who oppose God's anointed. And Moses wasn't a perfect man, we know that. He was God's chosen vessel, just as Joshua is going to be. And again, it's, it's not so much that God calls the able, God makes able those God calls. The whole point is God's calling. 
God's leading. It's not Joshua that's leading, ultimately, it's God. And in our lives, sometimes we may feel like it's all up to us as we think about our families and having to provide and protect and guide. It can be overwhelming at times. We can feel isolated. And I think for men in particular, we get that way. We can hold up and become isolated and think that we're all alone or terminally unique, but actually we're all going through the same thing in a sense. And we need each other and we need God who can ultimately provide, protect, guide through us. I'm so pleased that you men have come out to this Bible study because I think we have a lot to learn from each other and from the Word of God because it's a difficult time to be a man of God in this culture. Can you think of some ways it's difficult? Can be unemployed. Unemployed? The lack of morality today is a real struggle. It seems like you're supposed to follow the scriptures and yet people live it just seems like where sin isn't even believed anymore. It's like people just do what they want and it's hard to know because you can't tell others what to do and then you yourself know that there are things that um, that you have done that you're just as bad as them in many ways. And, you know, it's, it's a struggle. How do you talk to people today in our society um, and, you know, witness without coming off as a Bible talker too, you know? When I'm troubled and I need God's guidance, it comes to me every Sunday when I go up there to prayer of the people, how they have the things to say that comforts me and give me direction. I, some things in the last five years I couldn't, I would never imagine I could have done. But going up there Sunday, having whoever's there at the prayer rail, reassuring me that God's with me and to, that you can stand and do what he tells you to do. It has brought me so much closer that I can't believe it. I can't never ever imagine. That's the power of prayer. Of power prayer. of community, right? The power of prayer, the prayer of Christ over us. There's such a suppression of truth. Like if you try and talk to people about the Bible, it's just instantaneously you can't even mention it in some places. Like school, you're not even supposed to mention it. You can talk about Buddha, you can talk about Hindu, anything else, but Jesus, Bodhi, why him? He's singled out for that. It's 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 a suppression. It's a it's an attack. So that's very apparent to me. All the more reason to be strong and courageous. Exactly. Yeah. By God's grace. I think there's ways to do it. <clears throat> um, I, I teach in the public school system, so it's it, there's a fine line you have to walk a lot. Um, and, 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 you know, I mean, I'm teaching a, a certain subject, and if you're dealing with it historically, it's actually something you can do. Um, basically, they just don't want you preaching on any level. And But I think if you're a role model, if you're, you know, if you do things a certain way and you, you're, you're fair with everybody, I think that's a really good way to bring um, the greatness of God into everything you're doing. Because, you know, you can, you can do the things you need to do and you can, you know, just talk to people a certain way. And I think that's, at least that's what I do. Because I've known other teachers that have opened their mouths and said certain things and used the word God, and you know they get into trouble, and so I'm going to sort of be careful on how I say it. But I think there is a way that you can do it without being, I don't know what's the word. I don't want to use the word pushy, but use you know, mm -hmm. like that. Well, I'd love to talk to you about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think sometimes too we, we can get so caught up in what we should say or what we can can or cannot say, but. St. Francis who said, preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think it, there's a lot more to be said about what, what I was getting to, about what we're doing, what we're saying. You know, as men, as Christian men, you know, if, 
if people aren't giving us funny looks sometimes, or a lot of times maybe for how we're choosing to live our lives, we, we might not be doing it right. Um, I know I've felt that way for a long time. And, and you know, years ago I just had to be okay with kind of, you know, they don't want to call me a Bible thumper. I don't, I don't hit people over the head with, with the Bible that I, I take pride, and it's a weird word to use, but if, if you can, people can know that you're about God, that you're, even if at the very least they know you're about church and whatever connotation they associate that with, um, you know, I feel like as a Christian we should be proud of that to some extent. That you're, you're doing something right, not that you're doing everything right all the time. Um, I just, uh, yesterday at youth group, I had one of the, the newer kids kind of ask me, said, you know, uh, have, you, have you always gone to church? Did you grow up going to church your whole life? Yeah. On the way home last night, I was talking to Colin, and I just felt like that's that's a question a student asks or a kid asks because they they either aren't willing to or don't know how to ask the real question they want to ask, but they know that there's something different going on, and they they want to find out what that is. So I think just the way we conduct ourselves, and, and the way we treat others, the way we have conversations with one another can almost be a greater witness than opening up the Bible and, and talking to somebody about it. It's a commitment, you know. I, I sometimes wonder, you know, especially in this day and age where, you know, people can't, people aren't committed to anything. You know, you're almost afraid to, you know, like through ridicule or just because of the stupid pop culture that we actually live in, where, you know, to be committed to something as, you know, spiritually like this. I don't think people even understand it anymore. I think we've gone that far away that just, I don't think people get it. They might think it's antiquated or something like that. I would say there's more content yeah. for people than actually yeah. have. It's, they're somehow less intelligent than other people. It, it's unfortunate, right. Their I think for everybody who have come out on a Monday night to study the book of Joshua is radical. <laughs> it's radical <laughs> discipleship. It and it's right on. I don't want to be here alone. I'm thankful that you're all here. <laughs> and I'd like to conclude by reading Hebrews chapter 4, which references Joshua. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. This is saying that Joshua did not have the last word on rest. Something more would be coming. And that's the rest that Christ gives. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you humbled as we look at your word, an inspired, ancient word from you. And we see, Lord, based on our time of sharing tonight, how it is applicable to our lives even today, especially today, as we are called to be strong and courageous in Christ. I thank you for the men gathered here, the commitment to spend one hour a week with your word in the community of believers. Lord, whatever awaits us in this coming week, we know that you go before us. We want to be strong and courageous because we want you to lead us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.